You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 26, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. Our presenter is Dr. Matt Schmidt. He's a MedPeds resident at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Inflammation as to begin with, and so it triggers an asthma attack. 
And this slide just kind of shows that process. Asthma, like I said earlier, is an inflammatory condition uh, characterized by eosinophilia. And you see a lot of those same things in this kind of condition. Uh, they have inflammatory markers in their upper and lower airways. You can find numerous eosinophils from uh, serum, as well as from nasal or bronchial washing, or biopsy of the bronchial mucosa. Um, Interleukin-5, which is involved in eosinophil maturation, is also increased. And you can also see some other leukotriene production, such as uh, as far as origins, it's not really known, but the main theory that I came across anyway was just kind of an overblown immune response as a result from chronic viral infection. Um, going down to the third point, you know, a normal cytotoxic attack on respiratory cells would be beneficial in a viral infection. Um, they have this Cox inhibition, which is removed, or inhibition of the Cox enzymes, kind of gets rid of your protection by the PGE2. So specific IgG4 can be inappropriately elevated in these patients, causing the symptoms. Um, genetics have been studied. It seems like the Cox enzymes are expressed normally. And there's certain genotypes that are associated with this, but there's not like a clear link, and there's no real clear therapy we have, you know, based on these findings. However, there's a possibility that you can have a better earlier diagnosis with a good comprehensive genetic immunologic screen at some point. On the management, first of all, you want to remove the offending agents if they're still taking them. Um, and then just treat their asthma based on the severity of their control. Um, regular combination therapies, inhaled corticosteroids, long-acting beta agonists if appropriate. Um, since there's so much focus on the leukotriene kind of pathways with this disorder, um, there's been a lot of talk about using leukotriene receptor antagonists like Lotalucus and five uh, light oxygenase inhibitors like Dilutin, and they're commonly used. Um, didn't really find any good data that it actually does have a more effect on them than with regular asthmatics, but that's kind of the thought. Um, as far as pain management, if we're not able to take you know, aspirin, ibuprofen, those kind of things, uh, what do you do? Most of them tolerate selective COX-2 inhibitors like celecoxin, so for arthritis and that kind of thing, they can take those. And again, acetaminophen is usually well tolerated. Um, rhinosinusitis and this kind of chronic nasal polyps, so that creates a lot of problems for them. In fact, they may be seen by ENT before they even end up you know, being seen for by the allergist. Um, response to nasal decongestants and antihistamines may be some brief relief, but generally poor. Uh, topical corticosteroids are a little more effective. And definitive therapy for the polyps However, a lot of people, NSAIDs are indicated, especially in the adult population, problems like MIs, coronary artery disease, or other thromboembolic processes. Aspirin is really first line, and it's dirt cheap, so they definitely want to use it. Other conditions, chronic arthritis, they're not responding to Tylenol, and you don't want to put them on just jump straight to narcotics. They can do desensitization therapy. Um, this will involve kind of building up over several days. You do it, you know, in the office in a controlled setting where you have the appropriate therapy in case they have an anaphylactic reaction. But just giving them building up the dose of oral aspirin, and I found up to 650 milligrams BID. Um, they can take that at home for, you know, for a while on their own once they're stable until their symptoms improve and they kind of reduce the dose. If you just hope they don't have an underlying ulcer or something in the meantime. So that seems to work pretty well. So overall, this is surprising.
surprisingly common. I still find it hard to believe that 20% of adult asthmatics have this, but that probably involves some spectrum vascular sensitivity. Uh, but for people who do have it, it's a source of significant morbidity. Um, it's underdiagnosed. Probably there's people out there who just think they have really hard to control asthma. And so if something just suspects on, you know, children with polyps, adults with things like bilateral polyps or recurrent, um, management includes the avoidance and specific therapy to their asthma and side of symptoms. And pain control, desensitization can be performed if any to use NSAIDs. And in the future, we'll be looking toward finding the best therapeutic agents and just really understanding the genetics behind it. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. I would add that we would potentially do uh, desensitization just for severe asthma or recurrent polyps, even if they didn't have that other indication to have mm -hmm. um, asthma just to try and control their symptoms. When you do that, do you premedicate with with the uh, wood caps? Yeah. For the desensitization. And I think theoretically they would, but at Truman, I have never had a patient actually who could get the because it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the protocol includes the, you know, like the round time of the round time. Yeah. Um, now this is different than true allergy to non NSAIDs, so it's not like an IgE right. mechanism. It's a different type of thing. So why would desensitization work? <coughs> Any thoughts? And for IgE, I could see where you give it a little bit at a time and use up all the the IgE and the histamine and that all makes sense. But why why would aspirin desensitization work if it's not an immunologic mechanism? Yeah, you know, that that's one of the big questions, isn't it? Underlying immunologic <laughs> mechanism that we don't know about. Yeah. Using us all the <laughs> It yeah, sounds like almost inside. anything could be desensitized then, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, some things like the video contrast media, you can't, at least we don't. Isn't that the whole basis of homeopathy? <laughs> that everything can be desensitized. Yeah, but they never increase the dose. They always stay at a really low dose. dose. <laughs> Here we're actually increasing to a therapeutic dose. <laughs> which makes what we do right. <laughs> it's not as common in children as it is in adults, which suggests that it's an acquired disorder. It's not something you're born with. So you might be born with the genes that predispose you to developing this disorder, but but ultimately you're not born with it, so you acquire it. And why would you acquire it, and you know, maybe how can you unacquire it? Those are questions that need to be asked, and maybe you can, you all can do the research to answer those questions because we don't know the answers. So it's very very interesting. It's something that if you want to desensitize a patient who has asthma, you need to do it very cautiously. Uh, when I was a fellow, we used to admit people to the hospital to desensitize them because people can have really severe asthma attacks that are refractory to treatment. So it's something you do with caution. Uh, and I, I agree doing it in the outpatient setting makes good sense nowadays, but still you have to be very careful about it. Um, it's it, Like I said, it's less common in children, but it does occasionally happen. And we've had aspirin-sensitive asthmatics in the past who just kept coming in with asthma attacks. And they didn't know why. And eventually, we track it down and realized that they, when they took aspirin, they would have an asthma attack. And they'd end up in the ER. And usually, they took aspirin because they had a respiratory infection. And we just attributed it to the respiratory infection, not to the aspirin they were taking. Uh, so it's it's important to ask questions about what medicines they've taken, uh, whether it's aspirin or acetaminophen. And maybe if you have a question, suggest that they take acetaminophen for their next cold, and maybe it won't be so severe. Anything else? Good job. Thank you. Thank you. You're more than welcome to understand what's happening. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about Conferences Online Allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time. <laughs>